Today we want to talk about cash flows as we're developing a holistic church plant in a slum of uh, various cities. When we uh, move into uh, church planting in the slum, there are certain progressions each of which needs to be capitalized. The first is the development of uh, a worker in the slums who pioneers and who builds a church planting team. Out of the church planting team through evangelism uh, a church begins to form. And uh, then we have to consider the impact of the church on the community. The uh, church grows, discipleship occurs. The issue of land for a church building is a crucial issue. And then leadership develops, both elders and deacons. And these provide the basis for then uh, a growing uh, involvement in community development and programs within the community. Uh, ultimately, the issue of land rights uh, in a community is crucial. Perhaps a whole time frame for this kind of process is five to six. If we look first at the issues of entrance and the initial evangelism and discipleship, we can look at the uh, dynamics of funding for the church planting team. Uh, and the first thing is that without funding, evangelism can occur. And this in itself creates certain resources which enable the church to form. However, it's a lot easier if at the outset there is some capital um, which will fund at least the, uh, the leader of the pioneer team. Um, this capital really can come from three sources. Most urban poor church planters are tent makers. They are self-employed. In fact, this is really the key to the massive movements of churches in the slums of Latin America. Uh, secondly, there are denominations which have capital which can be used for the funding of a church planting team. In India, for example, often Westerners fund evangelists for two years at a time at about $100 a month. Um, and so there are thousands of evangelists wandering around evangelizing um, for those two years. Uh, at the end of two years, they move on and evangelize somewhere else, having established a group of believers. Uh, however, that's not necessarily um, a solid um, institutional base for expansion into the community. We'll come to that later. The third uh, place where resources can come from external to the slums is capital from businessmen in the city. Uh, again, in many cities, the economics are such that there's not a lot of capital around or there's too few Christians. However, in some cities, we're seeing this happen now in uh, cities such as Manila. We've got about a thousand churches in the slums or Mumbai, where there are now about 400 churches in the slums. And a good number of middle class businessmen uh, have been uh, developing or Nairobi, where again, there's a business class in the churches. Um, so that's that's the first phase which requires resources. As the church grows, then discipleship occurs, and um, as disciples, no, I don't want that one. as disciples um, are created or, or um, develop they themselves uh, begin to improve in terms of their working patterns and hence their income, their disassociation from gambling and drinking, etc. also releases more funding. So as they tithe, this produces a certain amount of income for the church. Um, again, generally not enough to support a pastor. Uh, but it is enough for the church to minister to some of the poor in the community. It's not enough for a church building. Um, and so up to a church of 50 to 80, um, that's what generally happens. 
we go beyond that, I've seen uh, some churches of 300 to 600, um, and the tithes from such people can actually cover the rental for a church building in the slums, almost. Um, and it may cover some of the pastor's salary, as well as uh, some of the ministry costs and some of the physical needs in the community. Again, it's, it's touch and go, but that's a level of size of church. Where the crucial issue in there after that initial pioneering phase is the issue of land for church building. Most slum dwellers, some churches are renting um, the building. And um, so while you have the development of healthy house churches for a while, uh, these do not survive um, very long uh, in the houses because the houses are poor. There's a lot of social pressure. It's a lot of pressure on poor families. Uh, people prefer to congregate in a building in a neutral place, be it a community building, a, a school, uh, and eventually what's needed is land for church building. So despite the rhetoric of the last two or three decades about house churches, they are essentially effective evangelistically. They're effective pastorally in middle class communities where there are large houses, but they don't provide a basis for sustainable church in the slums. Um, once the church has capitalized the buying of the land and some initial construction, uh, or once there's been enough capital to get the land, the church essentially can build its own structures. It might take them five, ten years to construct a complete church, but in the meantime, as they're building, they'll, they'll be using the property. And that's the way houses are built in the community as well, step by step as money comes in. Um, and the rent that has been paid out uh, can be used to continue to pay off any costs of construction or as that is paid off then the payment of the pastor and ministry costs. Um, now there are difficulties with this because the slums are places of illegality and yet even within the illegality there are rules within the slums as to who are the owners uh, which allow some semi-formal purchases and often there is land also just outside the slum which can legally be bought in a location where the people from the slum uh, find it quite accessible. Uh, now one way of doing this is to develop a is to develop a preschool or a primary school. Uh, the funding of a center for such is a, is a good investment of money. Um, it's relatively clean. It's quite difficult to be for it to disappear in corruption. Um, or the developing of a community center in a, in a slum. And so this is used during the week. Then on Sundays or during a weeknight, it can be used um, as the worship center. Um, there's a common fallacy that because evangelism can occur rapidly, then churches have been planted. What I'm saying here is that unless you move to uh, an institutional base for the church in the slums, it disappears. In Calcutta, the slums have been evangelized 2.4 times. The gospel has been preached, house churches have been formed. Today you can't find them. We have only a dozen, 17 actually, house churches in that city now. And they are sustained because of good pastoral structure and a linkage to a middle class church. Now if you go beyond the land for the church building, you come to the issue of holistic church or, or the church impacting the community. And uh, this brings in a whole another set of capitalization issues um, and may explain why most of the churches in the slums um, are not particularly holistic, the reason being that financially that's that's a bit beyond them. Um, 
to move beyond just meeting practical needs within the church, at least the leadership of the church need to be able to support their own families. Um, the eldership and the deacons um, need to be self-sufficient. And if they are self-sufficient, that in itself will create enough ties to um, at least pay the rent and, and sustain the ministry of the church. The pastor is still working in a full-time job to support himself. Uh, okay, so going a step further, going a step further, um, this requires input in terms of micro enterprise or credit cooperatives in a self-regenerating way. Most micro enterprise and microfinance organisations will not work through churches. Uh, they won't work through the pastor. They won't work through the organisation, but they will work alongside the church so that the leadership of the church can be uh, facilitated in uh, economic development. Um, and so as this happens, as the members of the church begin to earn more and more income, then that creates uh, a certain amount of um, capital for uh, personalized individual um, community development programs. To move that a step further um, requires foreign funding of a significant amount for the slums, um, or it requires outside funding from within the city. And this kind of funding is not helpful at the earlier stages of development um, because it comes in, it swamps the church and it creates uh, a lot of problems at this stage of development with the leadership Deacons having been developed, then it's feasible um, to bring in outside funding. Um, if you take an example from Nairobi in Kenya, a city where there are uh, a lot of churches among the poor, a lot of churches in the city, about maybe 2,000 in, in the slums, you start with the church planting uh, teams in the slum. Um, as evangelism occurs, it creates resources of people and tithes from within the community. Uh, the average person uh, earns about five to ten dollars a month. Um, sorry, tithes about five to ten dollars a month out of about a uh, hundred dollars of to two hundred dollars of income. Now, if it's a congregation of fifty, which is a pretty good size for a small for a slum congregation then you can calculate how much that is for the church. Uh, the difficulty is that only s that 60% are un or underemployed. So um, the idea of these new converts funding a church is pretty difficult. Um, $65 a month from a denomination is about what it costs to sustain a church planter through this phase. And um, the idea of capital from within the city is an idea that hasn't really been tapped yet. Now, as far as the church building goes, if they rent the building, it costs about $5 a month. If they buy it, it's $2,000 for a small room 10 by 15, expanding each year, uh, perhaps uh, by one room. It's good to start right at the outset with a small room. It just helps the church growth. Uh, but if you expand it $1,000 a new room every year, gradually you can expand the church I saw one church of uh, 300 members in the slum, an Anglican church, must have been um, one, two, three, about nine or ten one-room buildings that they'd bought and gradually expanded into a uh, galvanized iron roof. Once people have the land, if they can buy the land, the people will build their own buildings according to the, the slum design. I uh, by this time, as leadership is developing, ties may be going up to 15 to 20 dollars per month uh, for a congregation of perhaps a hundred. Um, and then the issue of of the leadership development and the economic development of leadership is significant. So skills development through microfinance capital uh, for church members is about a hundred dollars per initial loans. Then the community development, uh, different 
projects can develop from there. We switched over to Mumbai and discussions with pastors there. Um, the employment actually in Mumbai is greater and so self-employment for a pastor is a possibility. It's not common uh, but it is a possibility. And still the um, and the cost of funding a pastor is about a hundred dollars a month. That's pretty standard for evangelists. Um, and the evangelism still creates about the same amount. The land rent is um, still about the same as in Nairobi, about twenty dollars per month. Again, you can buy for two thousand dollars a ten by fifteen foot room and expand about a thousand dollars a new room per year in a new slum. If the slum has been there for twenty twenty five years, the closer to the city you get, the more expensive the land rises to about twenty thousand plus twenty thousand or so construction costs. And the giving in these churches is about the same as that of Nairobi. So again you can then the community development uh, different projects can develop from there. If we switch to Manila we find uh, pretty similar figures land and building and rent about four thousand dollars a month in a new slum uh, but to buy two hundred thousand uh, pesos um, and then expand that year by year if you buy in an older slum is 200,000 pesos plus the 200,000 for construction, initial construction costs, so capital investment. And again, the, the growth of the church provides income. Uh, Self-employment you know, is about the same. And $100 a month salary for a church planter is, is fairly common uh, and enables survival, if not uh, a healthy living uh, often a whole team will live together this cuts cost and often a pastor's wife is working in a in a paid job so that uh, that balances out that um, and then you move to the community development and that's where uh, capital and external capital becomes important now in all of this what are we talking about in terms of time frames um, basically from about five to seven years. Inappropriate funding, bringing in funding at the wrong time, um, destroys the human resource development, um, whereas funding at the right time for the land, for example, with a community project at the right time, uh, this, this can be quite significant. Um, and certainly funding for community development moves the church um, in those latter years, from the fourth to the sixth year, it moves it from just being a, a spiritual to being a, a holistic church engaging at significant levels with the community.